what were some of your greatest accomplishments, and here's the qualifier, by the time you were 12 years old? By the time you were 12, what were some of your big hits? <laughs> Garrett? Uh, I got a girlfriend. You got a girlfriend by the time you were 12? That's, that's your big hit. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think. I don't, I don't think I had a girlfriend before 12. Oh, wait, no, but after 12. Oh, after 12, okay. Well, but All right, all right, that, that could be, you were learning how to play basketball, so, so there's that. Anybody have any big, shining moments? Lauren? That's a big accomplishment. Not really that you did, but something that God did for you, because we're trying to be theologically correct, right? Uh, but yeah, that is a big moment, right? Uh, that is uh, your greatest accomplishment, but kind of not our accomplishment, it's God's accomplishment, but yet it's a great benefit to us. Um, but um, I thought that might be the case because as I look back at uh, my first 12 years of life, I don't know if there's anything that I would say, man, that's like a big hit of mine. Actually, I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes I look at my life now and I look at other people that are the same age as me and I'm like, what is my life? Like, what have I been doing all this time? Um, now, that's a, a not a correct view of my life, right? Um, because I understand that God has gifted me the way he's gifted me and you the way he's gifted you. And when we think of ourselves that way, we are, um, we are comparing ourselves <laughs> unjustly. But sometimes we think that way. Uh, but I looked up, um, I forget what the website was, but they had a database and you could put in whatever age you wanted. And it pulled up a list of a bunch of accomplishments that random people had by the time they were a certain age. So I put in 12 to see what would come up in this database this afternoon. And uh, Albert Einstein, apparently, when he was a 12-year-old student, taught himself Euclidean geometry. That's an achievement to teach yourself that. I'm, I'm going to be honest, I'm not even sure what Euclidean geometry is. Um, but apparently, by the age of 12, Steven Spielberg got his first camera. And right when he got his first camera, he immediately began writing scripts, drawing storyboards, and making short films. Um, and obviously that, that panned out for him. Um, French composer George Bizet had written some of his earliest compositions by the time he was 12. Uh, Thomas Edison had gotten started on his career, not that he had accomplished anything yet, but he had already begun to perform electrical and mechanical engineering experiments. Um, and I guess he did that thousands of times, the story goes, until he finally uh, made some headway. But... Uh, there have been people that have accomplished some tremendous things in their first 12 years of life. Um, I heard of the, the person, I think, that is alive today that has the highest IQ. They don't live in the United States, and I think they're about 60 years old now. Um, but I think they were able to speak by the time they were five months old. Now, parents, right? Would that be a little freaky? <laughs> have a five-month-old child speaking. But even though people can and have accomplished some tremendous things in their early years of life, uh, I'm sure all of them pair in comparison to the experience that Mary and Joseph had in raising Jesus. And in our study tonight, after uh, the past couple weeks where we've looked at the genealogies of Jesus and the birth of Jesus, we have now arrived at Jesus' adolescent years. And so we want to take a look at Luke chapter 2, verses 39 to 52 this evening. Uh, so if you could turn with me there to Luke chapter 2, verses 39 to 52. And in this study that we're doing on Wednesday nights, typically uh, we're going through the life of Jesus chronologically. And whenever we come across event, we're an event uh, or a stage of Jesus' life, we're going to take a look at the parallel passages uh, throughout the Gospels. But in this case, we're pretty much confined to Luke chapter 2, verses 39 to 52, because this is the only record we have of Jesus' childhood adolescent years. And even in Luke's Gospel, Luke is the only one that talks at all about his adolescent years. And even in Luke's Gospel, he only really talks about one specific instance. And whenever that happens, <laughs> 
it makes me wonder, okay, Luke, you're the only one doing this, and you're doing it in one special case, so why? And so we want to take a look at why tonight. So even in Luke's gospel, there's very limited information, and so we know that the one instance that he does point out must carry with it some heavy significance. And so let's read our passage tonight, and then I got a question for you. Here's the question. I'm going to give it to you before we start reading so that you can be thinking about it. Why do you think, as we read through this passage, why do you think Luke included this particular event in his record of the gospel? Let's start in verse, uh, well, it would help if I was in the right passage. I'm in Luke 10. Whoops. Luke chapter 2, verses 39 to 52. And it begins, So when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. And when they had finished the day, or the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it, but supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard of him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And so when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. And so Luke is the only one that includes this. He's the only one that talks about Jesus' adolescent years at all. Why do you think that Luke includes this in his account? And again, there's not necessarily a wrong answer on this one either. (laughs) She might be correct. (laughs) You know, I didn't think about that point um, from Luke's perspective that he was a doctor. And so that could very well be. It could very well be that he sees that and he says, wow, I don't uh, have a lot of (laughs) 12-year-olds in my practice. I don't know if Luke had a practice or what terminology they used back then, but um, I'm sure he dealt with adolescence and uh, it probably did uh, stick out to him. And Luke, uh, in addition to that, uh, in the early parts of his gospel, you can begin him, you can begin to see him unfolding something. And it's the fact that he is presenting to us in the early parts of the gospel, even at Jesus' birth and the announcement of his birth, people that are bearing witness to who he truly is. For example, in Luke, the beginning of Luke, Gabriel appears and bears witness that Jesus is the Son of God and that Mary will conceive and bear a son and call his name Jesus. He'll be the Son of God and he will save his people from their sins. An unlikely person bears witness about Jesus' identity in that we know that Elizabeth is pregnant with John the Baptist at the same time. And when Mary goes to visit Elizabeth, John the Baptist leaps for joy in Elizabeth's womb. And Elizabeth, knowing that John uh, is to be the prophet that announces the coming of the Messiah, she recognizes, whoa, even in the womb, John knows who is coming, and it is Jesus the Messiah. We see the angels reveal Jesus' true identity to shepherds, and shepherds go and they witness the true identity of Jesus as well. We see that when Mary and Joseph bring Jesus to be circumcised, that Simeon sees Jesus, and he bears witness that he is truly the Messiah. Likewise, Anna, who also received a promise from God that she would see the Messiah, 
when she sees Jesus, she recognizes this is the Messiah. And so you have all these people marveling at Jesus, which is also a theme of Luke. And as Luke tells the story of Jesus, he says all these people marvel at him and confirm this one thing, that he is truly the Messiah. And in this passage, he's doing something a little different. It wouldn't apply to somebody like you or me, but it can apply to Jesus. And it's that Luke is telling us this passage in particular, revealing this story about uh, Jesus in his preteen years, showing us that Jesus is confirming his own identity, even as a child, that he is the Messiah. And we'll take a look this evening about why that is significant, but we know that this story in particular is very important to Luke for this reason, and he dedicates more verses to this event than he does to an entire 30 years of Jesus' life. Let's take a look, for example, at uh, Luke's account of Jesus' life from his birth until he's 12 years old. Here's the account. It starts in verse 39. So when they had performed all things, excuse me, he's not at birth, he's eight days old, so close to birth. But he's eight days old, so when they had performed all these things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee in their own city, Nazareth. And here's Luke's account of zero to 12. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And that's, that's Luke's account of Jesus' life from 0 to 12. Now, there is some significant truth there, but it is very sparse in details. Uh, for example, Luke reveals to us, and the child grew and became strong. Um, not every manuscript uh, includes the words in spirit, um, so a lot of translations actually don't include uh, that phrase, but, but Luke's intention doesn't change regardless. That the child grew and he became strong. In other words, Jesus grew and he developed physically just like any other child did. Uh, he was truly a man. But he also includes in this growing up phase of Jesus' life from 0 to 12, or from 8 days to 12, uh, that he was a man and he developed just like other men, but yet he was a little different than other men as well. Filled with wisdom, or literally he grew in wisdom, which is also normal. Uh, hopefully, you hope that your, your child grows in wisdom uh, throughout their, their aging process. But I'm sure that Joseph and Mary observed that Jesus grew in wisdom beyond what other kids did, as we'll observe uh, by the time he's 12, he is wise beyond other 12-year-olds. Actually, he's wise beyond <laughs> the teachers. But he grows just like any other man. He grows in wisdom just like any other man. But unlike other men, the favor of God was upon him. And the favor of God can be upon us, but only because of Christ. But the favor of God was on Christ because God loved who he is that he was sinless, that he was God, very God, that he was exactly modeling what we as people should be. And so he had the favor of God, grew just like any other child. Hebrews tells us that though he was a son, here's something that I'm sure he had to learn during these years, Hebrews 5.8 tells us that though he was a son, yet he learned obedience. Imagine being the creator of all things. John tells us that without Jesus was not anything made that was made. You, you are literally the author of all things. Without you, nothing exists. And you have to be a child and learn to obey. That should, that must have been difficult. <laughs> I know it would be difficult for me, frustrating, to obey and submit to people that I'm more mature than and have more knowledge than and wisdom than. But yet, though he was a son, he learned during these years obedience by the things which he suffered. And Jesus grew in stature and in wisdom and in his dealings with sinful, fallen mankind in a way that 
he maybe hadn't before or hadn't before in the body of a human being. Hebrews 4.15 tells us that, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And during these years as well, Jesus faced every single temptation that we face. The only difference is, is that he didn't fail where we do. Um, as Pastor Brandon mentioned, he did not have the sin nature of Adam in him. He was virgin born. And where we all fail, he did not. He faced all of our weaknesses, faced all of our temptations, and he came away from every single one of them successful. I cannot imagine a kid younger than 12 being this perfect person. I've never met, actually, I've never met a person, right, that was a perfect person. Um, I don't think he's ever going to watch this, but the one person that I've never seen like lose their temper or say anything wrong is like Ken Collier at the Wild. Um, I've never seen him like lose it. But besides him, I don't know of anybody, <laughs> let alone somebody that's younger than 12. But yet this is what we know about Christ from both Hebrews as well as Luke. But yet that's all that Luke tells us. Hey, he grew, he aged, and he became wise. We skip down to verses 51 and 52. We also learn this about the time he was 12 until the time he was 30. Here's what we learn. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. He obeyed his parents. That's what we know from, well, from his birth until uh, he left the home. He obeyed his parents and was subject to them. But um, he was subject to his parents says in verse 52 that again Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and men. And so just as Jesus before he was 12, he continued to grow all the way up into adulthood. And that's what we know about that 30-year span, except for this special event that Luke decides to tell us about. So starting in verse 41, we see that Jesus bears witness of his own identity. And let's unravel uh, how significant this is for us. It says in verse 41 that his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. Now every year, Jewish men were required to go and to observe Passover. Uh, traditionally, Jewish men would go and they'd spend two days at Passover. They'd go, they'd do their thing, they would observe the feast, and then they would go back to their business. And uh, for some people, that was a significant sacrifice because they'd have to travel far. Uh, we know that Mary and Joseph traveled about 80 miles to Jerusalem. And so on foot, that's not an insignificant distance. Um, we're used to traveling that distance in our cars. Uh, but by foot, that would be a significant uh, amount of distance to travel. Uh, but they went and they traveled to Jerusalem for the Feast of Passover. Now, this is significant. What is it that the Feast of Passover is meant to observe? If you were in Growth Point on Sunday. Yeah, exactly. It is to remember that God saved them from the land of Egypt, set them free, that because of the sacrificial lamb and the blood of the lamb on the doorposts that uh, God spared the firstborn sons because of their faith and that God set them free, established them as a nation and uh, allowed them to leave Egypt and to have the freedom to worship God. And so they went and they observed Passover as was their Jewish custom. And at 12 years of old, 12, 12 years of age, 12 years of old is not really a phrase, but 12 years of age, uh, Jesus would have gone with his dad because dads were encouraged to bring their 10 to 12-year-old sons so that they could learn how to observe the Passover. Because by age 13, in the Jewish culture at this time, by age 13, they were well-established, responsible adults. Jesus would have been trained to be a carpenter. He would have uh, been able to carry on his family trade. And so he was about to become an adult. And the tradition was that sons would accompany their fathers down to the Passover or up to the Passover because it's always up to Jerusalem. But they would 
they would travel up with Jerusalem, and as they observed the Passover, it was tradition that the sons would say, Dad, what makes today different than all days? And then dads were to tell their sons about how God set them free from Egypt. And so this is what Mary and Joseph and Jesus went to Jerusalem to do. So they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast, and when they had finished the days. And so Mary and Joseph, uh, they are a good family. Joseph is a good leader. Uh, Like we mentioned earlier, it was custom that Jewish men were required to go, and so most of them would go for two days. But Joseph doesn't lead his family that way. He takes his family to Jerusalem, and he fulfills the days. He doesn't just stay for the Passover feast. He stays for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He stays all eight days. And so Jesus is raised in a good home. And as they returned, after they finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother did not know it. Now, one of the uh, movies that drives my mom crazy is Home Alone. Now, is there anybody, does everybody love that movie in here? I don't, I don't want to step on, on toes here, right? Uh, but my mom, she does not like Home Alone, and here's why. Because she says, how can you be, now there's some ir- irony, right, in her saying this, how can you be so negligent that you would leave your child somewhere? Now, the irony is that my mom has left me places, okay? <laughs> so when she says that, I'm like, don't you remember? But anyways, um, But I will say, she's never left me to Paris, right? So that's never happened. Um, But she says, you know what, that movie just drives me crazy because what mom would forget their son? And we're kind of left with that question here. What kind of mom would forget their son? But Jesus is a different case because in the mind of Mary and Joseph, they knew who Jesus was. And as Jesus grew up, he's never made a mistake. He's never disobeyed. He's always been where he's supposed to be. In their mind, he's supposed to be with us. We're good. Jesus is always where he's supposed to be, let alone the fact that they have other sinful kids, right? And they're probably trying to keep track of those kids and make sure that they're actually in the caravan because those kids might cause trouble. And so they suppose, in verse 44, that he's in the company, and they went a day's journey And then they sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned seeking him. Now, I don't know what was going through their minds when they discovered uh, Jesus is not where we think he is. I mean, I've never lost. I've thought that I have, right? Um, I worked with teens for 10 years. I've thought that I've lost other kids, other people's kids. (coughs) Um, It's terrifying. One time... um, one of our teens left their passport on the airplane, left the airplane in a foreign country, and I was like, we're going to lose this kid. Because we were already through custom by the time like, he said something, and I was like, oh, man. So like, we're on this side of the customs. We're looking at through the glass, and he's on the other side of the customs. And oh, man, when you think like you're going to lose somebody else's kid, that's a problem. <laughs> um, can you imagine Mary and Joseph like, man, we've lost God's kid. Um, that would be a, a terrifying thing. What, what's going to happen? We don't know. But they go back to Jerusalem seeking him, and now so it was in verse 46, that after three days, and so they left, and they traveled an entire day. They discovered that he was gone. They tra- traveled an entire day back, and they probably spent an entire day looking for him. And so it was that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers. Now, parents, can you imagine this? Can you imagine your kid goes missing and you finally find him at church? Of all the places, right? You might expect to find him in the candy shop or crying at the police station or something like that, but they go and they find Jesus, and where do they find him? They find him in the temple doing what was customary. It was customary that teachers would be sitting around and students would sit in the middle of teachers and ask questions and hear their answers, and they would learn that way. And that's where they find Jesus. They find him in the midst of the teachers. And here's an interesting thing about Luke as well, is that this is the last time that Luke calls teachers, Jewish teachers, teachers. From here on out, he calls them lawyers or scribes. 
It's as if Luke is saying, when Jesus becomes the teacher, these guys, they don't even hold a candle to him. Jesus is the teacher. But while Jesus is a child, Luke says that he's sitting amongst the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions, and all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and answers. Now, obviously, at this point, Luke is revealing to us something about Jesus. He's revealing to us that at this point in Jesus' life, he is very mature. He has really gained wisdom. As he grew up, he doesn't deal with what we deal with. We deal with our sinful nature. That was not part of Jesus' life. That did not affect his brain development like it affects ours. It didn't affect his physical development. Uh, Jesus was perfect. Um, not to say that he was extraordinary to look at, because the Bible tells us that he wasn't, but he was exactly as God intended man to be. He was wise, mature beyond the years of these teachers, which makes me wonder, what is it that Jesus is sitting there learning? <laughs> What is he learning from these guys? Because he's asking them questions. And I think, I believe, that what Jesus is sitting here learning from these guys is that Jesus knows who he is. We'll take a look at that in just a moment. But he knows who he is. He knows that he's the son of God. He knows what he's come to earth to do. And he's probably sitting there asking them questions about Passover, which they just observed, and about the sacrificial lamb. And, and at that time... Uh, so many sacrificial lambs were slaughtered that blood flowed out of the back of the temple. And asking them questions about all these things. Hey, tell me about the Exodus. Tell me about Passover. Tell me about forgiveness of sins. Uh, tell me, does this really change your life? <laughs> right? And I've wondered, what is it that Jesus is learning? And I think that what Jesus is learning is he's trying to learn how do these guys think? He knows why God sent him. How do these guys think so that I can serve them when I begin my ministry? Now, that's a mature 12-year-old. <laughs> Asking them questions so that he can figure out, so that he can learn, how do these guys think about redemption? And so the teachers were amazed. In the Greek, it means that they were beside themselves. Who is this kid who asks these kinds of questions and gives these kinds of answers? But his parents find him and they saw him and they were amazed. They were beside themselves with joy. Oh, he's not dead. Right? <laughs> Which we know that that couldn't happen um, because that was not God's plan for him. But they were relieved. They were beside themselves with joy to be reunited with Jesus. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? And she starts in on him like a regular mom. Now, um, I don't know exactly what Mary was thinking because what she asks him is, Jesus, why are you intentionally hurting us emotionally? And uh, I don't think that she believed that Jesus was trying to do that, but she has other sinful kids and mom mode turns on, right? And she's been worried after three days, and it clicks, and she says, Jesus, why are you you're killing me? <laughs> why are you doing this to us? And she says, look, in the imperative mood, uh-oh. That's like when mom says your full name, right? Look at me, Jesus. Your father and I have sought you anxiously. We've been our, beside ourselves with worry for three days. Why are you doing this to us? And here's Jesus' answer as a 12-year-old kid. And he answered, and he said, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Now, it probably could be better translated for our modern vernacular. Back when this was translated, it probably was great for that vernacular. But I don't know about you, but whenever I read, Did you not, I hear sarcasm, right? And Jesus is not trying to be sarcastic here. Um, there are some people that say, man, Jesus is kind of like talking back <laughs> to Mary. But that's not what Jesus is saying. What Mary is saying is, 
Jesus, we've been looking everywhere for you. And Jesus' response is not rude. It is, oh, you should have looked in the temple first. Like, you know who I am. You know that this is my house. You should have, if you would have looked here first, Mom, you really would have saved yourself a lot of worry. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, I belong here. I belong in the temple because I know that I am the Son of God. This is my Father's house. So it could probably be better translated, well, why didn't you just look for me in my Father's house? (laughs) Would have been a lot easier. Now we wrestle with the fact that Jesus was a child. And we think, man, I just can't wrap my mind around God being a child. Well, be encouraged, because verse 50 says that neither did Mary and Joseph. They couldn't get it either. It says in verse 50, but they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. What is Jesus saying, and why is Luke including this? As we observed earlier, Luke is including this because he's already told us a bunch of people that have seen Jesus, and they've said, this is the Messiah. And now... Jesus himself is saying, I know that I'm the Messiah. Why is that significant? It's significant because throughout Jewish history, there's been several false messiahs. And during this time in history, according to the prophecies in Daniel, this was the moment that the Messiah was supposed to show up on the scene. 484 years after the reestablishment of Jerusalem, this is the time. People were looking for Messiah. And Jewish history has several false messiahs. And so there are some people that say, well, when Jesus became around 30, you know, he was was sitting around one day and he thought, man, what am I going to do with my life? This is a false idea, by the way. Man, what am I going to do with my life? Should I be a dentist? No. Should I be a doctor? No. You know what? I'm going to be a messiah. That's not what happened. (laughs) It's not as if Mary and Joseph came to Jesus when he was 25 and said, you know, Jesus, we really think that this is the direction you ought to take. We really think that you ought to go and sit under this scribe and be tutored and become the Messiah. No, that's not the way it happened. Jesus, by the time he was 12, matured and had the self-awareness to know, I am the Son of God sent for this purpose to be the Passover lamb, and I need to understand how these, people, how these people understand Passover and understand redemption so that I can serve them. He is self-aware as an adolescent child. No one pushes him as an adult to become the Messiah. That was his identity, his purpose. And Luke includes this so that we know Jesus considered himself to be the Messiah as a child. And so as we continue in our study uh, in the life of Jesus, we can be confident. You know what? Um, Jesus has been witnessed by many eyewitnesses. According to John, 1 John chapter 1, so many people saw him and observed him and touched him. And Jesus himself, as a child, understood and had self-awareness and wisdom to know, this is who I am. I am the Son of God, sent from God into the world to be the sacrificial lamb to save people from their sins. So that, in, in Jesus' day as well as our day, when people say, you know what, maybe, maybe Jesus just caved to the pressure, like, like, like Gandhi, right? Gandhi, you should instruct us. Okay, sure. That's not what happened. Jesus knew exactly who he was and for what purpose he came into the world. So as we continue in this study and as we continue throughout our theme this year of faith over fear, this is the person that is the foundation of our faith that defeats fear. We can overcome fear Because Jesus, and Jesus is exactly who he says he is, 
He didn't develop these ideas over time. He always knew, and people always bore witness of his true identity.